So good morning. Um, so uh, we're on a journey as a country. Uh, we have a very aggressive policy, and the goal of that policy is to convert internal combustion engines uh, to reduce them by 50% by 2040, uh, 2030, and then phase them out by 2040. And I want to go through um, basically what it would require to achieve that. So if we can get my slides up on the screen, I don't know. There we go. So <clears throat> we have a competitor in this race, and the competitor is China, and they tend to win. Um, so what I want to do is I want to establish some baselines because um, if we're going to try to achieve this goal, where is the role for ethanol and biofuels if we're going to convert strictly to electric vehicles? So we need to actually understand what the baselines are. Uh, we want to understand what these tech materials are that gets us there and we want to understand who controls them, um, and we want to understand how this translates to winners and losers. So here it is, a good pie chart, and uh, they try to make it look like transportation is this horrible thing, but when you look at the entire pie chart, you realize transportation isn't a tremendously large part uh, because there's the entire agriculture, forestry, and other parts of industry that contribute. <clears throat> so, we wanna change things, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna dramatically increase green production of energy, solar, wind. When we increase them, what we're really doing is we're creating an incredibly profitable industry for natural gas. If you want to know who really supports green technology, it's the natural gas industry because they basically are the engine behind all of it. So um, what happens? You increase your green technology, you radically increase natural gas, you shrink coal, and what happens is you also shrink and even decommission nuclear. So the cleanest form of energy you could ever have nuclear is being decommissioned because of the way this thing works out and, and uh, with the trade-offs. I want to, you know, you all have kids and kids love memes. There's a meme for all these <clears throat> folks that are very excited about the future and their meme is first coal, then cows, right? For Iowa, I think that should be very poignant. They want to get rid of coal for energy and then they're coming after your cows. So, anyway, <clears throat> to achieve this dream, we need to extract from the earth a tremendous amount of critical materials. And what's important is you have to understand how difficult this task is, right? So we're gonna talk about what tech metals are, their proportions, and their comparative proportion to things we know and deal with every day like steel or aluminum. So here are the tech metals. In red, those are the metals that make up the, the technological things that you use every day. Your cell phone, the satellite that transmits that message, the F-35 that's supposed to defend our country. Uh, those things are literally everywhere. There's some others that aren't technically metals, uh, and there's, you know, so these are the groupings. These are the primary groupings of the materials that carry the future. So what's their percentage in the Earth's crust? So all the metals we're interested in actually represent a .003 or less of the Earth's crust. So these things are, are proportionately poorly distributed, unevenly distributed, and you typically don't find them in concentrations where you can mine them profitably. So there's a few issues here. Um, 
the, uh, the problem with tech metals is even if you find them, when you find them, the cost of extracting them out of the earth, the cost of converting them into a pure element, the cost of converting that pure element into a usable form, this is literally billions of dollars, right? And when you have an economy like the US where you only do things if it's profitable, and sometimes trying to extract these things and concentrate them is not profitable. So what happens is you get a very asymmetric balance of who produces these things. And it's going to be surprising for all of you. So here's a typical graph and it shows the elements uh, by their weight and by their, um, their um, percentage in the Earth's crust. So when you get over to that lower, the uh, lower, uh, what would be, I guess, left-hand side for you guys, those are the rarest elements in the planet Earth, right? So things like tellurium, T-E. Tellurium is an incredibly rare metal which is used in solar. Platinum is used all over the place in technologies and automobiles and catalysts. And that little grouping up there, I have a circle around that lanthanides are, are the rare earths, and those are the metals that make so many technologies work. So when you look at the most abundant elements on the earth, let me go back here, it shows you that oxygen is the most abundant. And most people think, well, yeah, you're talking about the air. No, I'm talking about in the earth, when you put a shovel in the ground, when you take a rock and you analyze what that rock is made out of, Oxygen is everywhere. So oxygen basically makes up 30% of iron ore. Oxygen is everywhere. But these supercritical materials, they're making up you know, parts per million, parts per billion on our planet. So that's how rare they are. So let's look at industry. The big block over there on the far right side, that's iron steel, right? We produce about two billion tons a year of steel. And when you go all the way over to the far left side, you're looking at the kind of materials that are needed in technology. And you know, quite frankly, some of them are so small, they hardly show up on that big screen. Um, so these are the materials you need to be part of a modern economy. These are the materials you need to make high margin products. These are the materials you need to be a relevant high tech economy in the world today. The problem is they're really not under our control. So who is leading in this space? You know, and what and 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 what are the what are the differences between mining these materials and having these materials in a ready form you can use for technology? These are big, big questions. And I've spent about 15 years in Washington, DC, trying to explain this little bit to members of Congress, to the Armed Services Committees, to the Pentagon, to three administrations. Here's what's really going on. What's really going on is if you're a country with a geopolitical agenda of total technology dominance, if, if your goal is to take technology materials and turn them into a hegemonic tool, then you don't need to mine them. Let somebody else mine them. The only thing you need to do is control those materials at the point where they go into a technology. So for example, China is, is, doesn't mine cobalt, but China controls 85% of the world's cobalt that goes into EVs, right? So guess who gets to make the decision on who gets these materials and where their factories get built? So this is a very hegemonic strategy. It's about controlling who gets to participate in a modern economy. So I'm trying to see what my notes here say. 
Right. So, so like I said, um, you know, just look at cobalt. They don't mine it, but they control it. Graphite. They mine it, but they also control it. In some instances, for specific applications, they're the only source in the world for refined spherical graphite, which is part of every EV. So, so it's a different game. The U.S. and our, our members of Congress, uh, they keep thinking it's a mining problem. It's not a mining problem. It's a, it's a refining problem. It's a downstream problem. So this is a, a, a graphic from the United States Geological Survey. They put this out every year, but it's basically backdated two years, so I apologize for the date. It's 2020 and today's 2022, but that's the way it works. So what they do is they try to show U.S. dependence on materials for industry. But the problem is when they measure this, they measure this at a very rudimentary basis. They measure it at the mining level. They measure it at a crude ore level. They don't measure these things at a level where you are applying these materials, you're bolting them onto an automobile. You're bolting them onto an F-35. So it distorts reality and policymakers look at this and they go, oh, so, okay, we're dependent here, but we're making headway here. And it's not realistic because they don't understand. It doesn't matter who mines this material. So that little blurb right there, that little box I put in there, that's, um, that's the Pentagon's best effort to solve America's dependency on China for rare earths that go into literally every weapon system that we use. Literally everything but the bullets uses rare earths. So this is the Pentagon solution. They give a bunch of money to a twice bankrupt mine in California who mines rare earths and they ship it to China, all of it. That's their plan. That's the Pentagon's plan. The Pentagon's plan is, well, we're gonna be, you know, rare earth independent. We're gonna, we're gonna you know, solve this problem. What did they do? They funded a company that was, that it was backed by the Chinese government that essentially digs these things out of the earth, concentrates them, and ships them to China, and then we wait and hope that they sell them back to us when we need them. This is insane. So let's get away from mining and let's talk about materials that you need for technology. When you take the same graph and you look at where the materials get applied, right? When they get bolted onto an F-35, when they become a component to a, ma to a battery for an EV, suddenly you see China's control of these materials is significantly different than what that original graph was telling you. So when you look at cobalt, for certain forms of co for cobalt that is refined to the point to go into an EV, they control 85, 90%. When you look at graphite that is refined to go into batteries, in some instances they control 100%. When you look at rare earths, they don't even want to mine it anymore. They're pushing that out to other countries to do it for them, right? They only need to control rare earths at the point of application where they're turned into metals and alloys and magnets. So if you want a rare earth magnet, you were 95% of the world's metals that become magnets come out of China. So that means the entire world is splitting 5% and that's how we're going to control our destiny. This is, this is a very disturbing picture to me. Okay, so how do we get here? At the end of the day, everything is about how you're looking at your future. And when you look at your future, you're talking about your kids that are in college or what you're doing with your career. And those things are about 
investing in human capital. And Americans, we usually, I think everybody in this room would assume that America leads the way in the development of human capital. But no, it's not true. The problem is we have pursued profits for shareholders, and in that pursuit, we let people that have lower cost wage for human capital take over this entire space. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at um, the value chain and where people are at, and we're going to look at who leads in all of the areas for EVs. And by the way, when I'm talking about EVs, I'm also talking about the entire U.S. defense industry. Same materials that go into an EV go into an F-35. So you, if you don't care about EVs, but you care about this country's ability to defend itself, just substitute EV for national security. So here you are. This is government's investment in human capital. This is the difference. Does, did anybody in this room expect to see this? Where the United States is not leading in technology and research and in the investment in human capital. Anybody wake up this morning thinking you were going to see this? It gets worse. I produced this, uh, this, this graphic. I hired an international patent company to, to, to produce this data because I didn't want the data tainted by myself or my biases. So this data is produced by an international company that looks at all patents in the entire world. And what it shows you is for, by country, who is applying for rare earth patents? And what this is showing you is that China this year is going to have more rare earth patents filed than the rest of the world combined. The rest of the world combined. For every one patent is that for rare earths is filed in the United States, the Chinese file about 35 patents. It's a 35 to 1 ratio. This is the difference in government's commitment to the future. Our government is so caught up in legacy issues that they don't look to the future, and China is building the future on our backs. And good for them. I don't think anyone should disrespect China's efforts. I think everyone should be impressed by their efforts. I think we should be jealous of their efforts, and I think we should demand the same from our own government. So, this is just for rare earths. This is the way it works. For the last 15 years, I went to Washington, D.C., and I told them, we have a crisis in critical materials, and it's not a mining problem. So, how did Congress respond? Well, obviously, it's a mining problem. And they wasted 10 or 12 years writing laws to lower, lower environmental standards, human health and safety standards, so that people could get rare earths out of the ground cheaper in the US. And when they achieved that goal and they used Defense Department money to fund a mine in California, what did they do? They created a resource provider who fed China's monopoly for the production of finished rare earths. That's how lost we are at the congressional level. So what's happening is China is essentially outsourcing mining because it's a dirty job and they don't want to do it and they want to preserve the resources they have. So what they're doing is they're outsourcing mining to other countries, including us. We're now their we now provide them resources. We now are a subservient nation feeding their monopoly. And as you go up that value chain from mined resources 
to the production of metals, alloys, and magnets, the value increases dramatically. In fact, 95% of all value associated with rare earths globally is in a metallic form. And China subsidizes the production of metals, alloys, and magnets to a level where it's literally mathematically impossible for someone to produce those materials outside of China. Now, you want to talk about smart. That's the guy who figured out that if you have a, a, a long pole and you have a fulcrum, you can lift anything. Why go down there at the mining level and try to dominate that? The only thing you need to do is dominate that last step. And by dominating that last step, they determine who gets these materials and where their factories are built. So when Siemens wants to build wind turbines to save us all for global warming, they get built in China. If Toyota wants to build a Prius, the components that make up the rare earth part of the motor get built in China. China gets to make these decisions because China's a very, very long-term thinker. They're very strategic. And people at the federal level literally cannot understand this. They cannot understand that it is not a mining problem. So let's get into that battery. Let's get into that EV. Let's look at things. So if you go through, if you look at this slide and you're looking at the various uh, places where resources are brought to the table, where resources are refined, where resources are put into a, a, a battery pack, where's the United States in all of this? Take a look. Take a look at those numbers. So if we're going to run headlong into an EV economy, and this is the single most expensive part of that vehicle, where's the U.S.'s participation in that economically? That's a pretty pathetic number, right? And that's at the end of the game. Everything before that is completely out of our control. And that little 10% we do have, the truth is they can take it from us. So you go, oh, Jim, you know, you're a pessimist, and we're going to, you know, we're the United States, and we're going we're gonna to win this fight. So this is a graphic showing current and planned production capacity for um, th this, this technology. Look at where China is on this, right? They're not building enough capacity to keep their space, right? They're not holding a spot in the line. They are the line. They're playing this game for everything. So let's go down and look at some other things, right? So when you want to build that battery and you look at their capacity, Look where China is in terms of capacity at every step in the value chain. You go, oh, look, Jim, good news. They're really not that big at the very bottom. Well, they don't care. Why do they want to mine it? Why do they want to destroy their environment? They'll let somebody else mine it. The only thing they care about is converting that into a product that gets applied to a technology. That's their game. Okay, so you're like, okay, Jim, that's, that's the lithium for the batteries, but it can't all be that bad. Well, for every battery in the world, you have an anode and a cathode. Look at their current and projected capacity. These are numbers that they print in English. They're on the internet. They don't hide anything. They're screaming what their plan is. And no one in Washington, D.C. seems to understand or care. They are playing for all. Okay, so Jim, that's cathodes and that's lithium. 
can't all be that bad. It just gets worse. Everything gets worse. So here we are. We want to build 50% of all automobiles should be electric by, you know, 2030. How do we get there? Well, to get there, we have to increase copper production by 10x. Now you guys are like, well, 10 times of something, uh, it's doable. Copper is a very unique element. We've mined all the best copper 100 years ago. When we're mining copper today, these deposits contain less than 1% copper. 99% of the earth that they, they dig and blast and process has copper in it. And we have to increase it by a factor of 10? That's crazy. That's, that's crazy. Where are the best deposits of copper in the world? Not here. Afghanistan. Who won that war? Did we? No. The Chinese won that war. Who do you think runs the copper mines in Afghanistan? The Chinese. This is true across the board for critical materials. Another problem is when you need a critical resource and you need to open a mine. In the United States, it takes about 10 years to open a mine, right? There's all the NIMBYs out there. You want to open a cobalt mine, and all of a sudden, and you're, you're in Minnesota. Well, the guys from California show up in your neighborhood, and they're screaming bloody murder that you're not going to open a, that, that cobalt mine. And sometimes that mine never opens. So what happens is, in the US, it is so difficult to open a mine for critical materials. But in China, open a mine tomorrow. So if we're going to pursue the goal of building an EV fleet in such a short time period, who is going to get the advantage? Who is going to enjoy the natural advantage of being able to exploit these critical materials? Not us. By the time we're opening our mine, the entire world has shifted. In fact, the materials needed to make a battery may be different. So as insane as those numbers are in the green bar, the 2040 numbers are even more ostentatious. I am telling you, I work in the mining industry. These are not real numbers for real people. You don't go into a boardroom and tell somebody you're going to increase production levels on a relative global basis by these magnitudes. Realistically, you say, hey, we're going to be like, half a percent of you know, global production. Nobody's 10% or 14 times, or in the 2040 numbers, look at this, 60 times? It's not doable. So, so there's challenges. And in addition to the challenges, there's gonna be costs. And what are the costs? We're gonna power green vehicles across America so that somebody in California feels better when they go to bed at night, right? There's gonna be cost. When you're gonna to try to transform the entire grid, let me back up. This is just for the automobiles, right? This isn't for the wind turbines or the solar panels or the tremendous amount of copper you need to tie all of this stuff together, right? No, this is just for the EVs. So when we want to do all of this and we have to buy mandate, we can't burn coal to charge the battery in a car because it's not green, so we need green technology. And what does it take to produce that much green energy have it on the ready 24-7, right? 
There are serious problems when you go down this road. The problems are that the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow and no one, no one has invented a storage system that can hold grid scale power. So what happens at night when the wind's not blowing? Do we all just sit at home and light a candle? That's not gonna happen. But this is not gonna happen either. Green technologies are so incredibly inefficient that they basically produce 20% of their nameplate. So you buy a brand new combine and it's got 400 horsepower. But it turns out it doesn't have 400 horsepower. It has 20% of 400 horsepower. It has 80 horsepower. It's not gonna do the job. That's true for green technologies. Global deployment of green technologies built out all over the world and studied by people that are proponents of green technology. They admit that they basically produce 20% of nameplate which means you're gonna to have to build five entire systems to get 100%, right? But how do you store that energy? There is not a system to store the energy. And if there was a system to store that energy, you know what it's gonna need? A lot of that stuff. So once again, there's another hungry mouth at the trough of technology metals. So in the end, this doesn't go real well. So another thing that um, proponents of green technology are finally admitting is that as you ramp up green technologies, as you cross the threshold from 20 to 30% green, you in totally destabilize the grid. When I say destabilize the grid, what happens is green technologies have a card and they get to the front of the line for everything. So when there's peak energy pricing and the wind's blowing, wind gets all that money. Nuclear, coal, natural gas have to stand down and make room for them. And as you go, as you transition from 20 to 30 percent, what happens is you economically and from a power standpoint, you, you destabilize the grid. So what's happened in the real world is these folks that run green technology and wind and solar jumping to the front of the line and, and everybody accommodating for them, the baseload systems are in financial crisis. And the United States has shut down a number of nuclear facilities to, because the nuclear facilities can't remain profitable because a nuclear plant can't ramp up and ramp down quickly. So what happens is they know that at you know, 7.30 in the morning, the wind's gonna start blowing because the sun just came out and they have to run at 40% of capacity to make room. And when you're running at 40% capacity, you're not profitable. And then we read headlines. Oh, you know, renewables, more profitable than nuclear. Well, that's only because in the political economy, we've transferred all of the profits to that industry and we've stripped all of the profits from baseload. And as baseload becomes unstable, you as consumers of energy are gonna pay the price because they're not paying the price, they have guaranteed income. So, <clears throat> this is the much dreaded ISO duck. The ISO duck is a graphic that shows energy demand on a daily basis. And what it shows is that base load is providing energy and that at a very reliable, dependable time, renewables come online and all of the base load has to retreat from the market during peak power 
This is the only time they actually make money. So as the baseload utilities are forced to withdraw, and the baseload uh, does not participate in the, in the profitable portion of supplying energy to consumers, you have a flood of renewable energy. And then it goes away very predictably. We have a planet, it spins, there's a sun, there's a lot of debate on what circles what, the sun, we don't know what's in the center of the universe, but we do know that about, you know, every 24 hours there's a cycle. It's very confusing, but that cycle is 100% predictable, and what happens is when the sun goes away and the wind slows down, the demand for power is so extreme, the spike in demand is so extreme that there's only one thing that can solve the problem, and that is the backer of all renewables, natural gas. Natural gas, the most expensive form of electric energy you're gonna have, they turn them on, they're called natural gas peakers, and they fill the void. They consume all of the profits. You know, the renewables live on government subsidies. The natural gas industry is making good old-fashioned profit. What they're actually doing is they're building a monopoly. Because as you cross that threshold from 20 to 30 percent, coal and nuclear are decommissioned. They are literally decommissioned because the environment won't allow them profits. So the only, person, the only industry that can make up that is natural gas, and they're consuming all the profits. The entire green revolution runs on natural gas. So this is something most of you don't know, but when you're producing renewable energy, a whole lot of it is essentially, they call it dispatched, right? But what are curtailed. But what they really mean is it's thrown away. Huge proportions of renewable energy get wasted every day of every year because when it comes on, when Mother Nature provides it, it doesn't line up with needs. And the, the volume of energy that becomes available spontaneously is so extreme that the cost for renewable energy can go negative. Like when I say negative, they have to pay somebody to take the power and curtail it. They need to pay somebody to take that electricity and boil water because they can't put it on the transmission lines because they'll blow the transmission lines. So we're living in a world where you're creating negative value. So, we need to understand this dream of EVs and green tech. And for me, it's, you know, a movie we all probably have seen. In the movie, this, this guy builds a baseball field. There's no players, there's no team. But you know what? He believes that it's gonna happen. That solution is literally gonna walk out of the cornfield. And that is literally the, we are living in that movie, and I'm telling you, nobody's walking out of the cornfield. It's going to be a problem. So, in addition to all those high-tech critical materials that you use, when you look at producing energy using things we know about, steel and concrete and everything else, just look at the difference in the amount of materials required to produce one kilowatt of renewable versus one kilowatt of nuclear. So it's not just that we're taxing the, the resource base for these critical materials, we're taxing everything. So in conclusion, it's gonna be winners and losers. The winners are China who's already dominated the entire field, monopolized all the, the critical points in the system, and 
So as we pursue this, we're essentially handing China the baton. We're essentially handing them the crown of victory. They're going to be the winners. Who are the losers in the end? It's going to be American consumers, right? So I'm not against making a better environment. I'm for it. But building a system based on dreams that have no place in reality is a very dangerous game. And that's the game we're playing. And my time just ran out. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jim. It's just thoroughly um, fascinating, um, I suppose would be one adjective. And I know we don't have a lot of time, but I would uh, recommend if you do have a question, make your way to the microphones. We'll, we'll try to uh, uh, pick some of those off. And as you talk about this issue, and we think about it here at the summit relative to transportation. But I can't help but sit there and listen to you and wonder about the broader national security implications. And so I'm curious as you, as if you could uh, describe, you know, having done this for 15 years, consulting with the military, uh, visiting with our political representatives, what, what's your response? What are you hearing back? What's the reception to the, the information you're giving? So universally, when you go to Washington, D.C. and you talk about these issues, you know, you want to go in and you want to play your strongest hand, so you talk about national security. And it's, you go in and you say, listen, these materials are what make these weapon systems work, and if China controls them, then we can't build them. This is a real problem. That doesn't seem very controversial, right? Well, their response is, oh, that sounds like a mining problem. And I tell them over and over, it is not a mining problem. China doesn't even want to mine this stuff anymore. It's about having a vertically integrated value chain where you convert these very low value resources coming out of the ground into extremely high value products. And if we don't control that, we don't control our destiny. And I mean, I don't know if there's a special species of politician, if, I don't know what it is, but they can't understand that. And it's so important that, that you communicate to your, your elected officials that the United States needs to be a player in this game, and we don't want to be the guy digging the dirt out of the ground. We want to be the guy in the lab coat producing high value products so that technology companies build and make things here and not in China. Very good. We're going to, the gentleman, uh, if you're ready for a question, we'll, we'll uh, take that, please. Yeah, John Norwood here. Jim, thanks for that presentation. Fabulous. What, so I'm hearing you say maybe we need to come up with a thoughtful industrial policy strategy and some of the uh, oil and gas infrastructure on the coast might be repurposed or something? What, what do you think the path forward is? So, <laughs> I love that question because it's pure common sense, right? Maybe we need a national industrial policy, right? Who would think that that is a, a controversial statement? Who would think that industrial policy is somehow contentious? Anybody want to raise a hand? Anybody. Nobody thinks that's, you know, beyond the pale. But if you go to Washington, D.C., and you say, what's our national industrial policy? They, you know, it's like, it's like 1950 and McCarthy and you're, you know, you're Joseph Stalin. They're like, what kind of communism are you spewing? We're America. We don't do industrial policy. That's evil. But that's the truth. That's how America became the greatest country in the world because our government was aligned with businesses and when they knew it was important and America needed the lead, the government found quiet ways to lend a hand. And then came 
1970 and a guy named Milton Friedman in the Chicago School of Economics. And now industrial policy or planning or anything along those lines is somehow some dark, deep red evil. But in fact, we need an industrial policy because China operates on a grand industrial policy. They're running on a policy of national industrial and defense strategies so that they can control the world from a technological hegemony. If they control access to technology materials, they control the future. And all we're, we are so obsessed with the past and we're so obsessed with the free markets that we're losing our place in the world. So, love that question. <laughs> anyway. Well, Jim, once again, I want to thank you uh, for your remarks here this morning. Just uh, very, very interesting. Uh, please join me in thanking Jim Kennedy again for being here.